Age, and I'm delighted to say we have uh, uh, Kristen Fortney of BioAge, who is um, uh, just just fresh off the plane, uh, having done another conference in LA not, not 24 hours ago. And uh, Kristen, it's about 120 million you've raised so far, or something like that. Is that uh, right? 127. That's 127. Right. right. Great. Okay. So uh, very excited to learn about how you're moving into these important clinical stages. Because that's perfect to hear. So thanks. Oh, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Yeah, and th thanks for helping. Uh, definitely very jet lagged, <laughs> so be gentle. Um, let's see. All right, so BioAge is a platform driven, now clinical stage biotechnology company advancing a growing portfolio of therapies that treat severe disease by targeting basic molecular mechanisms of aging. And just a snapshot of where we are today. Um, so, a core part of the company is our target discovery platform, which is based on decades of human molecular and longitudinal health records and I'll go into that in more detail. We have, as Phil mentioned, a clinical stage portfolio today uh, that's growing over time, and we've raised around 130 million to date. And you know, the big motive here is what can all of us do with more healthy time? I have a few intro slides, but I think I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, but basically, you know, when we're talking to, to regular investors, this. This, this graphic on the left here is the real motivation, right? Like the two biggest killers in the United States, I'm sure here in the UK as well, are heart disease and cancer. And these are tremendously different diseases, but they share one tremendous driver, risk factor, which is how old you are. These are not diseases that happen to 20 year olds by and large, they happen much later. And the pitch here is that not only just for, for aging, but if we look at these diseases of aging through this new lens of aging biology, we're gonna discover important new targets to help treat them. And part of the rationale here on the right is, we, you know, right now there's this gap between health span and lifespan. The average lifespan is around 80 or so. The average health span when you get your first chronic disease of aging, around 60. So that's a quarter of your life where you're, you know, accumulating more and more chronic diseases. And we know we can do better. So there's some extreme examples, of course. There's nothing special about 80 years old. There's some great examples in the animal kingdom, like our, the Greenland shark that makes it to 400, or if you look at, at other, you know, <laughs> even more distant uh, life forms, there's trees that can live for thousands of years. And just briefly, this was actually the figure that first got me interested in Asian biology when I was a PhD student. I think this was published in, in Science or Nature, uh, but by some of the greats in the field. And they said that, well, with our average lifespan of 81 today, Imagine if you could cure all cancer, and cancer was, was no longer an issue, it didn't happen. That would, in fact, only move the average lifespan to around 85. And, and that was a big surprise to me, right? You think it might add 10 or 20 years, but no, it would only add four years. And again, that's because of the graph I showed you earlier. These are diseases that happen predominantly to older people, right? So if it's not cancer, it's, it's heart disease, or it's Alzheimer's, diabetes. And in contrast, and then the purple one at the bottom there, if we were able to translate this growing list of therapies that we've shown reproducibly can extend mouse lifespan and health span, and if those translated directly to humans, we could add 10 to 20 years of, of healthy life. And that's why I'm so excited about the field, and I think that you know, it's a very exciting time for the science. The field has really made a lot of progress in the past decade. So briefly, BioAge is focused on, on human aging, on building this kind of what I see as a missing layer. Um, so aging as a scientific field is fairly new. It's still a new science. Um, you go to most major research universities and there's a handful of people who work on aging and maybe vastly many more who work on cancer or diabetes or any single aging-related disease. And it really sort of dates back to the early 1990s when it first became a, a real scientific field. And that's when, I think prior to that, this is what I've been told, that everyone thought, oh, aging is so complicated. So many different things go wrong as you age. Why would you think there could be a simple thing you could do that would dramatically extend your lifespan? And that idea was proven wrong first in the early 1990s with the work of Cynthia Kenyon and Gary Rebkun that in a worm showed that you could delete one gene, just one gene, and double the lifespan. And that, I think, amazed everybody. So what you see in the 1990s is this influx of researchers who are really experienced with worms, um, with yeast, with flies, um, which are very, very different from us, right? These animals only live for a few weeks. Um, they don't get the diseases we get, but they actually went through and tried knocking out every single gene in the genome uh, one at a time to see what would make animals like worms live longer. And the interesting thing is that actually like well over 100 things work, right? So sort of nothing special about natural lifespan. And then it's really only in the last, you know, in the 2000s, the last decade and a half or so, 
And we've been able to start building out a list that reproducibly make mice live longer. Mice are much closer to us, of course. Um, they're mammals, they live for years instead of weeks. Um, they're still quite different, though. So mice in the lab die pretty much exclusively of cancer. Uh, that, you know, black six mice, or even four-way cross mice, the more genetically diverse mice that some people use in aging studies, they die exclusively of cancer. You could have in your hands, you know, a drug that cured heart disease um, and give it to these mice for their lives and it wouldn't do a thing. Um, so these mice never on their own get heart disease, they never on their own get Alzheimer's. This is one reason why, for example, we've cured Alzheimer's over 100 times in mice, but never in people. And so that's why we think it's really important to have this, this human layer of aging which in a sense is the hardest thing to build, right? Because we age over decades. Um, and we think we really need molecular data that span decades to understand how humans age. And this is where we've invested heavily at BioAge in sort of building this human layer. And, and the idea is really simple, right? Like there already are a lot of people who live for a very, to a very ripe old age very successfully. There are, you know, one in a thousand people make it to the age of 100. Many of those people still have functional brains, have functional muscles. And our whole approach at BioAge is to ask, what's different about these successful agers versus the rest of us? And this is just showing here a distribution here of the age at death in people in some of our cohorts. So at BioAge, we're very driven by data. We use AI, biobanks, and multi-omics to directly decode the biology of human aging. Now, the key thing, so we have about a handful of biobank partners that are pretty unique biobanks. They're biobanks that started collecting samples from healthy middle-aged people 50 years ago. So these are really precious samples that have been conserved for decades. And these samples are connected to health records with basically the entire future history of those people's lives until their deaths. And our approach is fundamentally to go into these samples, enumerate every molecule in there with modern technologies, and ask what's different about those people who go on to live 60 only, right, versus those who will go on to live 90 plus in great health. And this is something we're only able to do now. Like for example, in each one of these samples, we're looking at you know, 7,000 different proteins, 3,000 different metabolites, 10,000 RNA transcripts. Um, these technologies weren't available even a decade ago. And then it's really a big data problem to tease out the most important pathways. And a snapshot of where we are today, we've you know, generated over 65 million molecular data points across 10,000 patients, across 45 years of aging. And just to give you an example, the biobanks that we've partnered with, they have information on, you know, like I said, the future life history of these people, including how long they live, what diseases they get when they're older, but also critically their health span, right? Because we're not just looking to look, live longer, we want to live longer in great health with functional muscle, with functional brain. So this is just a handful of the examples of variables that we have for all of our human samples, things like cognition and how that changes through time, things like muscle function, looking at walking speed and grip strength as those change throughout the life. And here's just a snapshot of, you know, what if you look at 7,000 different proteins? And the interesting thing here, so we've basically colored them by, you know, red if they're associated with future muscle function, green for cognitive, uh, purple for renal, and blue for cardiovascular. And as you can see, right, like some of these are associated with only one health span outcome. Other ones are, are predictive for longevity and multiple health span outcomes. And those are the ones that we're most interested in. And there's a few different ways of using this data set. So there's the, the way on the left here, which is you might have heard in talks earlier today, there are these sort of known hallmarks of aging, things that seem to be really key um, to aging, at least in animals, right? Um, things like senescence and telomeres, mitochondria. And one way we'd like to think of our human data is this, this layer on the literature, right? So you might see a pathway that matters a lot in a mouse. If we also see a strong signal for that pathway in the human data, now I believe it's gonna be translational, right? So it's sort of useful layer on the literature. Um, but additionally, we've called that the untracked wilds here. There are going to be pathways that matter only in human that have not been discovered yet in mice or lower species. And our data can help point the way there. And you know, I think that th there are so many different pathways that are gonna work in aging. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, there are like dozens of things that work in invertebrates. I, I expect there are gonna be dozens of important targets in humans too. And there's a lot of different science being done right now that I'm really excited about. Things like you know, artificial organs or reprogramming and gene and cell therapies. Uh, and our focus at BioAge is on the top, which is really these rapid clinic ready drugs to benefit the patients of today. So a lot of the things that are promising are still in very, very early stages. 
and it'll take a long time if they were approved in really helping patients. So we're really focused on near-term multi-mechanistic bets uh, to benefit today's patients. And just, you know, in terms of a focus area, you've probably heard, if you have in your hands an aging drug, there's a lot of different directions you can take it. At BioAge, we have three different thematic areas. We focus on the muscle, on immune aging, and on brain aging. And these are very deliberate choices that we think are at the intersection of, one, they're very well covered by our, our human data sets. We've got relevant variables in our human data sets. Um, two, we think there are predict predictive preclinical models. I mentioned earlier, there's unfortunately no great mouse model of Alzheimer's, right? But there are great mouse models of muscle aging, of immune aging. And third opportunity. So for all of these, we think there's both high unmet need as well as a very practical clinical path that we can take to get there. And, you know, I think you've heard this from a few people, right? Like all of us, we ultimately want to get the broadest possible um, approvals for these drugs, right? We want to, you know, generate the next class of things like statins. Um, but that means starting with a more practical first indication to be really sort of pragmatic and optimize for that first approval. Uh, so here we like to select our initial model indication, our first disease that all by itself will be incredibly valuable, as well as uh, where we can run in a very efficient phase two trial to get to that human data set. Because as you, as you know, in biotech, you get surprised all the time in the clinic. So you have to be very practical there. But longer term, we're aiming for really real aging indications with high prevalence, huge market potential, and high unmet need. So really briefly, this is my leadership team. Um, like all together, I'll just, you know, we have a wonderful team. I won't go into great detail about all of them. I can highlight Paul Rubin. He's our chief medical officer. He's personally responsible for the approval of over 10 different drugs um, in multiple biopharma companies. And if you look at my team at the VP level and above, we've been involved in over 750 trials, 130 INDs, and 100 US regulatory approvals. We've got a great board too, Vijay Pandey from Andreessen Horowitz, Jason Coloma from Mays Therapeutics, and Rekha Hamarjani, uh, who's currently the CEO of Samsara Spec. And our approach really is to build this, this, this machine. So we have this really differentiated R&D capabilities that help us you know, enable scalability and build competitive modes. So I already mentioned the leftmost box here, which is that we have this really unique human data that helps us figure, figure out compelling targets that will be translational to human, in humans, translational in clinical trials. Now, the second step here is target validation, right? So you see a great signal in the data. Now you want to test it out interventionally in an animal model. So we have over 7,000 uh, naturally aged mice, mice in-house and really deep phenotypic assays to see if the, tar the, the drugs that we're, that we're evaluating do what, we, what they think they're going to do. And we also like, so we like to basically look for anything that we see is really exciting in the human data. We like to see that in a mouse, it does things to slow their aging, one. And two, that it has a strong efficacy signal in a first aging-related disease, because that point, that really de-risks your clinical trial. And then three, um, we move things that check both these boxes forward to clinical development. So I'm going to give you a concrete example of how we go all the way through from <coughs> platform discovery to animal validation to now clinical trial that's ongoing right now. So in this case, we're starting off with our human data set, and we were explicitly looking for targets that were relevant to future muscle function. And there's a lot of different variables in our human cohorts that are relevant here, things like how long you live, but also your walking speed and how that changes through time, your grip strength and how that changes through time. And you can build a composite muscle aging score. Uh, and basically look at that across your entire population. And out of that analysis, we got the graph here on the bottom left. This just shows for 7,000 different proteins the histogram of your muscle aging score. And one of the outliers on the right here is a protein called apolin. And it was especially interesting to us because it was the most outlying protein for which there already existed a drug out there. And if you look on the right, it's got this nice linear relationship with longevity and muscle function. So what this means is that if you're middle-aged and you have more apolin than you know, other people, you're more likely to live longer, you're more likely to have functional muscle, actually as well as cognition as you grow old, like in a linear way, so the more the better. So we were excited about um, this pathway. We reached out to Amgen, the company that had built this drug, and under an MTA, they gave us um, some of the drug to evaluate in-house. 
and they put it into several different mouse models of muscle aging. And I'm showing you this one piece of data here, which directly informed our clinical trial design. This is the, the experiment where we saw the largest magnitude effect the fastest. And what this is, it's an immobilization assay. It's a casting study. So you take a really old mouse and you cast one of its arms. And after three weeks, you take off the cast and you weigh the muscle. And as you can see on the right there, the muscle loses half of its weight. So it's really dramatic muscle atrophy. But in the mice on this drug, we actually saw no significant difference. So we got pretty excited about that. So based on our data package, we you know, did a deal with Amgen. They're a shareholder in BioAge now. And we've initiated and will soon complete uh, a phase 1b trial in healthy older volunteers at bed rest. So this is based on the mouse data. We're trying to have a, a human study as close to it as possible. So in our trial, we have people over the age of 65 who are sitting in bed, you know, not moving for 10 days, after which there's substantial measurable muscle loss um, by ultrasound and, and declines in muscle quality. And we're going to compare um, people, you know, placebo people to people on our drug to see if it can rescue uh, the muscle changes. And yeah, just a, a little bit more about the trial design. As I mentioned already, so it's a multiple dose cohort in patients at bed rest, um, 10 days of bed rest with one dose of, of IV dose of VGE105. And we're looking at muscle size and dimensions, muscle quality, muscle mass and protein turnover, as well as biomarkers. And after this, where do we go next, right? So I, men I mentioned before that for all our programs, we like to go first to a really practical, efficient indication. And our choice here is something called diaphragmatic atrophy. And this is addressing these about 5 million patients every year who are mechanically ventilated. Now remember the mechanism here is that it prevents muscle from atrophy. And your diaphragm muscle is one of your muscles that's used to working 24 seven. So when it's immobilized, it experiences substantial atrophy in a matter of about three days. Um, and when that happens, that's really bad for you. It predicts basically a long time in ICU. It quadruples your risk of mortality. So this is the next population that we're going to go into. Um, we're going to go into about 100 people who are being mechanically ventilated. And longer term, we think this is the drug that could be beneficial for sarcopenia. Everybody loses muscle mass as they age. It has dramatic functional consequences. It's a tougher nut to crack as an indication, but we're really excited about the potential of the mechanism there. I didn't show you the data, but we also gave this drug to really old mice in their, um, in their water for three months. And it improved their running meal speed, it improved their grip strength. So it's basically muscle wasting first, but then there's a lot of indication expansion potential beyond that. And that's an example of how we do um, drug discovery and development at BioAge. And I touched on this already, right? But basically all of us in the field, we're optimizing that for that first approval. And then you can see label expansion over time. And the great example here is, is statins that were first approved for an orphan indication, hypercholesterolemia, and then now you know, are really prescribed to everybody above the age of 40 with a couple of risk biomarkers. And uh, yeah, I'll end with a quote. Our aim should be to help our patients die young as late as possible. Thank you.